I want to invite you today to open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. The theme of this particular ASI convention is, Here am I, send me. So we're going to study primarily Isaiah chapter 6. But let's bow our heads first for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne and we come boldly because we come in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of gathering together to sing praises to your name, to speak with you in prayer, and to hear your voice speaking to us through the ministry of your word and the Holy Spirit. We ask that you will be with us this morning. Open our ears that we might hear, open our eyes that we might see, open our hearts that we might receive, and empower us to live in harmony with what you have for us today. This we pray in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, amen. God did not raise up prophets in a vacuum. He raised up prophets when the occasion was necessary. And Isaiah is no exception to this rule. Isaiah was raised up by God because God's own people, Israel, was in what might, we might call a Laodicean condition. Let's read Isaiah chapter 1 and verses 11 through 15 where we find the problem that existed in the days of Isaiah and why God raised up this prophet, this major prophet. I'm going to begin in verse 11. God is speaking here to Israel. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have it had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample on my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Quite a picture, isn't it? Of God's professed people. Now the question is, who commanded all of these celebrations? The new moons, the Sabbaths, the rituals. Who had commanded these things? God. And yet he says, I don't want any of this. You see, Israel was in the same condition as the Jewish nation in the days of Christ. And that's the reason why Jesus quoted Isaiah when he referred to the religious leaders of that Jewish age. Jesus quoted in Matthew 15, verse 8, Isaiah 29 and verse 13. These words are well known. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, Israel was performing all the right rituals, but their heart was far away from God. Another prophet from the same period, Hosea, is quoted also by Jesus. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, is quoted in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 7, where Jesus said, I desire 
mercy, not sacrifice. So both of these prophets, Isaiah and Hosea, are describing the problem that existed among the people. Not only in Isaiah's day and Hosea's day, but also in the days of Christ. Because Jesus quoted the words of these two prophets. The condition was very similar to the condition of our church, the church of Laodicea. You say, how do we know that? Because Laodicea says, I am rich and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. But verse 20 of chapter 3 of Revelation says that Jesus is outside the heart knocking. Is it just possible that we are honoring God with our lips and with our ceremonies and our celebrations, but our heart is far from the Lord? Clearly, Revelation tells us that our problem is the same problem that exists in the days of Isaiah. Now I want to invite you to go with me to chapter 6. This chapter describes the call of the prophet Isaiah. Now God is going to use Isaiah to give a message to Israel and tell them, I have been raised up to rebuke you. I have been raised up to help you see what your situation is so that you will accept the message and remedy the situation. The call of Isaiah is taking place in the year 739 B.C. to a people who were religious but not spiritual. God gave this call to Isaiah seven years before Israel, the ten tribes of the north, went captive to Assyria. And at the beginning of chapter 6, Isaiah is in the temple court. And God gives him a vision. Let's read that vision in Isaiah 6 and verses 1 through 4. In the year that King, King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. What a vision of heaven. And the way that the angels worship. Notice that four of the wings are used to cover themselves. Now what does that mean? Ellen White wrote in the book Story of Redemption, page 153, the following words. There, beside the heavenly ark, stand living angels at either end of the ark each with one wing overshadowing the mercy seat and stretching forth on high, while the other wings are folded over their forms in token of reverence and humility. The angels are awed by the holiness of God. Do we need a vision of the holiness of God today? in the way in which we worship. Absolutely. When we come to church, we are coming to worship the king of the universe. And we should be just as respectful as the angels in heaven. And so we find Isaiah totally overwhelmed by a vision of the holiness of God. By the way, 
The word holy appears 56 times in the book of Isaiah. And his favorite expression is the Holy One of Israel. He was deeply impressed when he had a vision of the holiness of God. So first of all, we notice the condition of Israel. Now we have seen the vision that God gave to Isaiah. And next we have the prayer of confession of Isaiah. Notice verse 5. So I said, notice when he sees the holiness of God, when he sees the reverence of the seraphim, he says, woe is to me, I am undone. You know, why do we many times have a good image of ourselves? Because we're not contemplating the holiness of God. So I said, woe is to me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When he beholds the holiness of God, he now confesses his unworthiness. Ellen White wrote in the book Prophets and Kings, page 307, As Isaiah beheld this revelation of the glory and majesty of his Lord, he was overwhelmed with a sense of the purity and holiness of God. How sharp the contrast between the matchless perfection of his Creator and the sinful course of those who, with himself, had long been numbered among the chosen people of Israel and Judah. So as he beholds the holiness of God, he sees the unholiness of himself and of the people. And he is overwhelmed. You know, his reaction was the same reaction of all of the holy individuals in the Bible. When Moses met God, at the burning bush, we're told in Exodus 3, verse 6, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, we find these words, Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees, and on the palms of my hands. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Peter after the miraculous fishing expedition described in Luke 5 verse 8, he said to Jesus, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And John in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17 says, When I saw him, that is Jesus in his glorified state, I fell at his feet as dead. So when we behold the holiness of God, we behold also our unworthiness. The reason why many times we feel we're okay is because we are watching other things that demean our concept of the holiness of God. By what we watch and we listen to, we lose our respect for a holy God. But now here comes the good news. We've seen the condition of Israel. We've seen that Isaiah had a vision of the holiness of God. When he had the vision of the holiness of God, he confessed his unworthiness and the unworthiness of Israel. And now we have good news for Isaiah and for the people. Notice verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. This is the altar of incense. And I'm going to say a few things about the altar of incense in a few moments. But let's read verse 7. 
And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Now, let's look at a few things about this altar. Go with me to Luke chapter 1, save your place there in Isaiah, Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. This is speaking about the father of John the Baptist who is serving in the sanctuary, and he goes in to offer the incense in the sanctuary. And I want you to notice what the incense represents. You have the incense, and you also have a, there what the incense symbolizes or represents. It says there in Luke 1 verse 8, So it was that while he was serving, this is Zacharias, was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of the incense. So the incense is being offered and the people are outside praying. The incense is related to prayer. The prayer of God's people. Let's go to Revelation chapter 8 and verses 3 to 5. We're talking about the altar where a, a coal is taken out to touch the lips of Isaiah. Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 through 5 says, Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. This is the same altar, the altar of incense. He was given, how much? Much incense. That he should, now notice, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. The incense does not represent prayer. It is related to prayer. The incense is mingled with the prayer. Now what could that mean? Once again, to be offered with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Now what is it that is mingled with the prayers of God's people? What was mingled with the prayer of Isaiah? I'm going to read a beautiful statement from the devotional book by Ellen White, Sons and Daughters of God. This is a phenomenal statement. Christ has pledged himself to be our substitute and surety. What is a surety? Guarantee, right? And he neglects no one. There is an inexhaustible fund of perfect obedience accruing from his obedience. He's made a deposit in the bank of heaven of an inexhaustible fund. What does inexhaustible mean? <laughs> that it never ends. And it accrues from his perfect obedience. She continues, in heaven, his merits, his self-denial and self-sacrifice are treasured as incense to be offered up with the prayers of his people. As the sinner's sincere, humble prayers ascend to the throne of God, Christ mingles with them the merits of his own life of perfect obedience. Our prayers are made fragrant by this incense. Christ has pledged himself to intercede in our behalf, and the Father always hears his Son. Isn't that an incredible statement? That was the attitude of Isaiah. He said, I'm undone. Woe to me. I'm unworthy. And what is God's response? He says, your prayer is accepted, and a call is taken from the altar. And what is done with the call? This is the next point. Isaiah chapter 6 and verses 6 and 7 once more. It says there, 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away. Let's stop there just for a moment. Your iniquity is taken away simply is describing forgiveness. Because he has beheld the holiness of God and has prayed that he is unworthy, now a call is taken and God says, Your iniquity is taken away, you are forgiven. We all know that verse in Proverbs 1 verse 9 where it says, If we confess our sins, is that what Isaiah did when he beheld the holiness of God? Yes. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I'm going to stop there. Isaiah asked for something more. He not only asked to be forgiven, he asked to be made holy, to be sanctified, to be purged. Because the last part of the verse of 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It makes me think of the hymn, Rock of Ages, Cliff for Me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed, and now notice, be of sin the double cure. Be of sin what? Now, what do we need to be? What does double cure mean? Ah, cleanse me from its guilt, that's forgiveness, and power. Isaiah not only wants to be forgiven, he wants to be cleansed. By the way, you remember the terrible sin of David? By the way, I can just mention four sins that David committed. Murder, adultery, theft, and covetousness. Just for starters. You say, well, theft? Yeah, he, was, he stole somebody else's wife. Murder? Yeah, he had his, his, uh, her husband go to the battle and be killed. Adultery goes without saying. Covetousness, he desired her before he took her. Now, if you really look carefully, you'll find that he broke all of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> but I'm just mentioning four. Psalm 51 has the record of David's repentance of his sin. His prayer of confession. His unworthiness. And I want you to notice that David wanted two things. Not one. He not only wanted forgiveness for what he had done, but he wanted his heart to be cleansed so that he would not do it again. Notice Psalm 51 verses 1 and 2, and then we'll read verses 9 and 10. He cries out to God, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Forgive me. Blot out my sin. Then I want you to notice verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And then notice verses 9 and 10. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And then verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Why is this important? Because Jesus says that our big problem is not with our actions, but with our heart from which the actions come. You know, if you have, a, you have a dirty stream, you know, that's spewing out rocks and mud and everything, it does no good to stand next to the stream and pull out the rocks and the branches and everything. You, you have to cleanse the fountain. Where all this comes from. 
In Mark 7, 21 to 23, Jesus said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So if God forgives you what you do, but He doesn't cleanse the fountain from which these things come, it's going to be a frustrating Christian experience. This is the reason why Jesus quoted Isaiah. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. By the way, Isaiah wanted this experience to be the experience of all of Israel, not just Isaiah. Let's go back to chapter 1 and verses 16 through 20. Chapters 1 and verses 16 through 20. Isaiah wanted this for the people. God wanted this for the entire congregation. Here we find these words. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. See, not only forgiveness, but cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebu rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And then he says, if you are willing and obedient... You shall eat the good of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So what have we seen? We've seen the condition. We've seen the vision. We've seen the confession. We've seen the forgiveness. We've seen the cleansing. And now Isaiah Here's a voice in heaven. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who is going to go to Israel now and give them the same vision? Who is going to announce to Israel what Isaiah has seen so that they can have the same experience? And Isaiah, overwhelmed, forgiven, cleansed, blurts out, Here am I, send him. <laughs> is that what he says? Notice, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? He blurts out now, here am I, send me. Isaiah hears the question asked in heaven, and immediately volunteers to witness. When we catch a glimpse of the holiness of God, our own insufficiency, God's incredible love to forgive us and to cleanse us from sin. Our reaction will be, send me to tell others about this experience. We will want others to be blessed as us. We will become missionaries. Maybe the reason we're not missionaries is because we haven't had Isaiah's experience. We haven't understood God's great love and forgiveness, His power to cleanse us from sin. Maybe that's the reason why we don't feel impelled to tell others about the wonderful God that we serve in the various businesses that we represent. I'm not saying that everybody's going to be a preacher. Have mercy. But wherever we're working, whatever we're doing, 
if we have known Jesus, we will witness about what God has done for us. By the way, you know after David was forgiven and cleansed, do you know what he said? Psalm 51, 12, and 13. David says, Restore me, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. And now notice, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. So David becomes a witness after he has had the experience. It reminds me of the story of the Samaritan woman. I told that story on Thursday night. You know, Jesus meets this woman there at Jacob's well. And uh, it's midday. Really, you know, in Israel, people don't go at midday. It's hot. And so Jesus is sitting there. And the woman comes. She seems to be ignoring him. So Jesus says, give me water to drink. And the woman, first of all, says, well, how is it that you, a Jew, asked me for water to drink? The first impression she has of Jesus is that he's a Jew. As the converse, conversation continues, she says, I think you're a prophet, when he tells her about her life. And at the end of the story, she says, I believe you're the Messiah. She drinks the water of salvation. <laughs> She says, I want that water. Jesus gives her that water. What does she do? Instantly. She goes back to Sikar, her town. And she goes from door to door. I found the Messiah. I found the Messiah. I found the Messiah. And she recruits the whole town. And meanwhile, Jesus is there at the well. His disciples returned because he sent them to get some provisions, some food. And um, when they come back, they say, we brought the food. Jesus says, my food and my drink is to do my Father's will and to finish his work. And the disciples, who at this point in their lives were not cognizant, of what Jesus said, they said, well, maybe somebody brought him some food while we were gone. And then Jesus pointed in the distance, he said, you've heard that there's four months to the harvest? No. The fields are white, ready for the harvest. He was not pointing to fields of wheat. The Desire of Ages tells us that he was pointing to this woman who was coming with the entire town of Sikar to meet the Messiah. The woman who drank the water became a fountain of water to bring other people to the feet of Jesus. We could also say the story of the Gadarenes, those demon-possessed men, chains hanging from their hands and feet saliva running out of their mouths, shrieking like beasts, people running when they saw them, tearing themselves apart. And Jesus heals them. Now, when Jesus told the demons, gave permission to the demons to go and went going to the pigs, the people from that region said, we can't have this guy with us anymore because he brings about great financial loss. <laughs> Imagine all those pigs going into the ocean. That was a huge fight. And Ellen White says that they were Jews raising pigs. Jews were forbidden even to touch pigs. And these individuals are raising the pigs. And so these men who are in their right mind, well dressed after Jesus cast out the demons, they say to Jesus, we want to go along with you. We want to continue listening to your words of life. Jesus says, no. Go back to your own and tell them the great things that God has done for you. Now, Jesus was asked to leave, leave the region, but there were left two missionaries. 
And Ellen White explains that sometime later, Jesus came back and there was a multitude of believers there because of the witness of those two men who had experienced salvation. Ellen White wrote in the book Christian Service, page 9, every true disciple, how many? What kind of disciple? Okay, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. In the same book, page 21, she wrote, Everyone who is connected with God will impart light to others. If there are any who have no light to give, it is because they have no connection with the source of light. She also wrote, The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. But we all give kinds of excuses. This is what we pay the preacher to do. I don't know how to speak. I'm too busy. I don't have time. I'm afraid that I might be rejected. The message we have is a bit unpopular. All of these are simply excuses. Every person that is born into the kingdom of God is born a missionary. In one way or another. But the story in Isaiah continues. Witness is not always easy. God told Isaiah, if you go back to chapter 6 and verses 19 through, 9 through 12, his task was going to be extremely difficult. By the way, the words of Isaiah appear on the lips of Jesus later on. Have you ever read those verses where it says, uh, you know, uh, oh, give the message so that their eyes do not see and their ears do not hear? That comes from Isaiah. Notice verses 9 through 12. This is God commanding Isaiah now. And he said, go and tell this people. Notice that doesn't say my people because of the conditions that they were in. Go and tell this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. In other words, most of the nation would receive the message negatively would reject the message of Isaiah. And then Isaiah asked, until when do I have to preach? Notice, verse 11. Then I said, Lord, how long? How long do I continue preaching? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. In other words, until the end comes. Now Jesus quoted these words in Matthew 13 in verses 10 to 17. So Isaiah is told, you're going to witness, and most of the people that hear your message are going to reject your message. But you need to continue preaching until the end comes. Do you know how Isaiah died? Isaiah was a martyr. You say, really? 
The Bible doesn't tell us that he was a martyr, but the spirit of prophecy does. And not only that, other publications as well. The Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud, which were written around the year 200 A.D., and the book, The Lives of the Prophets, written around 100 A.D., and the work, The Martyrdom of Isaiah, written also around 100 A.D., tell us that the prophet was enclosed in a log, and they saw, sawed the log, the, the log in half with Isaiah inside. By the way, Hebrews 11 verse 37 hints at this. It says, some were sawn asunder. And Ellen White wrote, concerning Isaiah, one of the first to fall was Isaiah, who for over half a century had stood before Judah as the appointed messenger of Jehovah. Witnessing is not always easy. Do you know that persecution has always arisen because of people witnessing? Why isn't the church suffering persecution today? It's because Ellen White says that it's because we conform to the world and therefore we awaken no opposition because we have muted our message. The Bible tells us that every time that the message was given, there was persecution. Let me just mention some of those cases. Cain and Abel. Do you know why Cain killed Abel? Because when they were in the field, Ellen White amplifies that Abel tried to reason with his brother. He said, brother, if you bring a blood sacrifice, God is going to receive your sacrifice as well. That infuriated, the message infuriated Cain. And he arose and he killed his brother. The message of Noah went over like a lead balloon. If Noah had been a conference evangelist <laughs> and had an evangelistic series of meetings that lasted 120 years and there were only eight converts and all members of his own family would have said his message was a failure. Almost everyone rejected his message, yet he preached. And what will we say of the prophets of the Old Testament? Can you tell me one prophet that the people loved? Who hated the prophets? The very people that the prophet belonged to. Because they shared a message that they didn't want to hear. What about John the Baptist? Oh, you know, Herodias, she did not like John the Baptist saying that you should not be committing adultery. And she added in for him because of his message. What could we say of Jesus? The message of Jesus brought about opposition and eventually led him to the cross. Peter and John after Pentecost. They're in the temple teaching. The Sanhedrin says, you can't teach in the name of Jesus. They say, we receive our orders from a higher authority. They're thrown in prison. They're beaten because of their message. What could we say about the Waldensians? Who actually wrote verses and pieces of parchment and became missionaries to distribute portions of scripture. They were hunted like wild beasts. And at the end, the same is going to happen. Let's notice our scripture reading. John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and verses 1 to 3. Here Jesus says to his disciples, and some people say, well, that was just, he was just talking to his disciples. So when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, he's talking to the disciples. That's only a promise for the disciples, right? When Jesus says these words, he's talking to us. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. 
Today we call them what? Churches. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service, just like Israel killed Isaiah. Notice John 15. John 15, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said to his disciples, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Why did the world hate Jesus? And why will the world hate the disciples and God's people at the end? If you were of the world, the world would love its own. If we accommodate the culture, culture will have no problem with us. There is silence here. This is the truth. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now we are not to covet hatred. We're not to look for hatred. But when we're about our Father's business, our message will be counter-cultural. And culture will not like it. But to a point we've mood, muted our message. Because we want to be popular. We want to be liked. We want to be politically correct. We should not speak to offend. But when the truth is spoken, that is ultimately the result. People are offended by the truth. Matthew chapter 24 verse 9 Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9 tells us that there's a persecution coming. Let's read Matthew chapter 24 and let's read the context as well. Matthew 24 and let's begin at verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. If you think that's bad, by the way, read Great Controversy 589 and 590. Ellen White adds many more so-called natural disasters to the list. She mentions tsunamis, she mentions tornadoes, she's, she mentions all different kinds of fires, etc. And she says that these things will become more frequent and more disastrous. Now what is Satan's agenda here? Notice the very next verse. Then. By the way, are these, things that, are these things increasing these days in the world? They most certainly are. But it's going to get a lot worse. Because Jesus said this is the beginning of sorrows. Then. They will deliver you up. To tribulation. And kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So what is our message for today? The benefit of Isaiah's story will help us understand the process that we need to follow. First of all, we need to recognize our condition. Secondly, we must have a vision of the holiness of God. Third, we must confess our sinfulness. Next, we are to receive forgiveness for our unworthiness. And ask the Lord to cleanse us and to give us a new heart. And then, we are ready to say, here am I, send me. The work will be difficult because most people will reject the message. But the good news, and I end with this text, is that there will be a remnant that remains. Notice what we find in Isaiah chapter uh, 6 and verse 13. 
but yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. So even though our message does not produce mass conversions, there will be a remnant, a stump that remains, a small group that will be saved in Christ's kingdom. And the value of one soul is greater than the world and everything in it, according to the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White states that, that a soul is of infinite value. One soul is of infinite value. How do you buy something that is of infinite value? By paying an infinite price. And that Jesus did. So my prayer for all of us, including myself, is that we will have the experience of Isaiah. And when we have the experience that we will go out, no matter what kind of work we do, and use our influence for the furtherance of Christ's kingdom, for reaching those who are hungering and thirsting for God's truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the message of Isaiah. We want that experience. So we ask, Lord, that you will give us, us that experience because we cannot do it ourselves. I ask that you will bless every soul gathered here this morning. Take what we have studied, plant it in our hearts, that we might be like Jesus and we might witness no matter what might come, because we know that it will bear fruit for your honor and your glory. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.